few weeks ago we have looked at our first read on this channel that was O and today it's time to look at Vici. This is the second read that we're going to be analyzing on this YouTube channel. I think there's a lot of interest in these reads. I think they are very famous mostly among dividend growth investors and if you're looking for usually a growing stable income some of them can be a good choice. Of course analysis is always required. For example is their dividend safe? How are they doing on that? Can we envision a dividend growth in the future? And this is usually what we do also when we analyze other stocks. Vici is a REIT that was suggested to us by one of our viewers. And it's a different kind of REIT from Realty Income. It's actually a REIT that is focused on gaming. So they have, in particular, properties in Las Vegas and some golf course. If we look at the investor presentation, we can see the expansion of VG in the last few years. Differently from Realty Income, which is a very old REIT, VG is a relatively new one. It was started in 2017 and it expanded very quickly. So they have in Las Vegas some of the iconic places, for example, the Caesar Palace and uh, the Venetian. And so they are different, first of all, because they are focused on gaming and uh, other activities that happen in Las Vegas. Now Las Vegas is trying to diversify a little bit from gaming, so there are also conferences and so on. And also because it has lower number of properties and the rent per property is actually much, much higher than for other REITs, for example, realty income. So they have these non-commoditized differentiated assets and they performed quite well during COVID, for example. So they had 100% rent collection. And so this is quite good. They have a 5% yield. This is in, generally speaking good, even though at the moment we know that short-term treasuries also give us 5%, but of course, treasuries don't offer growth. But so this is the situation for Vici. They don't have a long history, but they have this differentiated asset. They are focused on gaming. Now, if we go on Stratosphere, we can take a look at their impressive growth, actually, in the last few years. So they started in 2017, 18. They were relatively small revenues below a billion dollars. Now, in the trading 12 months, it's $3 billion. If we look at some of the other metrics, for example, for a REIT, of course, one of the important metrics is debt because they typically buy relying on that. If we go on balance sheet liabilities and we see total debt, we see that they have about $16 billion in debt. And if we want to assess whether or not this debt is too much, we could go on cash flow statement, operating activities, and the last row is net cash provided by operating activities. This is operating cash flow, and it's about two billions, slightly above two billions. So it's about eight times. So this is typically a lot for a normal company, but it's in line with realty income. And also we need to consider that the debt is used to buy assets that uh, are typically real estate. So they follow a different dynamic than uh, other assets that depreciate. We can also take a look at the ratios, in particular valuations. So if we start from, let's say, 2018 to the most recent figure, we can see that uh, in particular on the price to sales and the price to operating cash flow, the multiples are slightly higher than five years ago. So we see that the multiples have been expanded a little bit, but they are not extremely high. They are also in line with other REITs, for example, realty income. So one of the questions, of course, that we have is, is the price too high or not? So first of all, as we've done with Realty Income, we can apply the same methodology that we use for other stocks. But in this case, we just take into account the operating cash flow as the measure of cash flow and we capitalize it in order to get an estimate of the enterprise value and then the fair value of the equity to establish how much growth is baked into the price. So in this case, for example, we see that the operating cash flow is around 2 billions. And if we capitalize it at 5%, we get 40 billions. So this is the 
fair enterprise value. So the current enterprise value is 47. If we then remove from the 40 billions, the 16 billions in debt, we end up at 24. So the fair value of equity in the case of no growth would be $24 billion, while the market cap right now is 30. So we see that there is a little bit of growth baked into the price. And one way to estimate this growth is just to divide the current price by the fair value without growth that we estimated, so 24. And this is a 25% growth baked into the price that could be realized over many years. So 25% doesn't seem so much, actually. So uh, given the rate of expansion that they had in the last few years, even after COVID, it seems very likely that uh, they uh, will be able to do it. Now, of course, one of the questions in my mind is what changed actually after COVID was also that the Fed hiked rates. So what I looked at is what is the debt schedule, so how much debt they will need to refinance in the future and at what rate. So we will make some computation to give a sense of the impact of the Fed rate hikes on VG. So if we go on the investor presentation, we can take a look at the debt schedule. So we see that they don't have debt remaining debt in 2023, so this year. They have a billion dollars to be refinanced or paid in 2024. And then they have about more or less uh, two billions from 2025 to 2030. And then they have more debt later on. But so this decade, they have only one billion in 24 and then two billions more or less in each year from 25 onwards. So what is the impact of the Fed hike? So what I did is I considered the cost of debt that VG has now, which is around 6%. And then I consider, let's say, an unfavorable mortgage rate or an unfavorable rate at which they could need to refinance this debt. So in particular, the debt in 2024 is just $1 billion, so they actually could have the free cash flow to, to repay it. But suppose that they want to grow, so they are not going to do that. They are going to refinance it. And the new interest rate will be higher than that. So will be higher than the previous few years. So let's say that it will be exactly like the spread that the Fed rate hikes imposes on investors. So it's about 4%. This would mean that they refinance at 10%. So this difference, the 4% on 1 billion is 40 million. And so also in 25, the 4% of 2 billions is 80 million. So let's suppose that they will need to refinance at these higher rates, and so the new interest expense will go up. So if we go back on stratosphere, we can take a look at interest expenses right now. So interest expense is around $600, $700 million. And we computed that maybe they will need to come up with next year $40 million more which is a small amount, and then another 80 million more in 2025. So we see that actually, given the debt schedule, given the fact that they don't have too much debt to be refinanced uh, soon, in the next few years, the impact will be relatively small. So from now to 2026, they will need to pay just 120, 150 million dollars more, probably, which is relatively small compared to the operating cash flow, which is 2.15, 16 billion dollars. So essentially, this tells me that the impact of the higher interest rates is very modest. And so given the quantity of debt, the amount of debt that REITs can have, this is actually an important aspect to take into account in my view. So we have seen that historically they grew quite a lot, quite fast. We saw that in terms of the valuation, the valuation is not too high. There is some growth that is baked into the price, but it seems that it's very doable. It's not a crazy valuation. And third, we estimated that the impact of the Fed hikes is relatively modest. So these things are relatively good. 
One aspect that is still unclear in my mind is what if a recession hits and what is the impact on this particular kind of read, so gaming, focused on gaming, in a recession. Because one thing is, for example, for realty income, we saw last time that they have many, many big corporations that are renting from them. And these corporations typically offer necessary services. So probably they will withstand a recession. But in this case, since the nature of the companies renting the properties is not defensive and the number is different, is smaller, what is, for example, comparatively, what is the one that could be more impacted by a recession? So this is a question that remains open for me. Great guy, thanks. And I guess this concludes the video for Vici. Compounders, let us know what you think about it and let us also know if you have other reads that you are interested in. Consider subscribing if you like this channel and you like the video and we're going to see you on Friday. Bye bye.